Okay. Thank you, everyone. I thought I was going to be a bit loud. Um, well, thanks very much for the, uh, the invitation. Um, this is going to be a little bit different, I guess. Uh, but what I wanted to do was give you an idea of the kinds of things that uh, Greenpeace, uh, as a global campaigning organization, is doing with science. Um, I'm not sure how many of you know that Greenpeace has for more than a quarter of a century, nearly 30 years, run its own analytical facility. Uh, it used to be based at Queen Mary and Westfield College in London. It's now based uh, at the University of Exeter, where it's been since 1992. So we're quite well established as a research group in the, uh, in the University of Exeter. Um, and what I'll do is just give you a, a bit of background as to what we do, and then talk more about the work that we do on, uh, on microplastics, which is, of course, one of the big environmental uh, issues of the uh, of the time. So this is uh, the full extent of the, the Greenpeace research labs. Um, we have to work with all of Greenpeace's offices around the world, so that's more than 40 offices, uh, as well as Greenpeace International's organization, which is based in, uh, in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. And you can see we're quite a small team, so we tend to be quite busy. Um, it's uh, an interesting task. Um, we're all coming at this from an academic background. So we're not campaigners trying to do science. We're all uh, qualified academics with our own research backgrounds that have come to Greenpeace in order to, uh, to do the research. Uh, and we've got a mixture here of uh, uh, toxicologists, marine biologists, terrestrial ecologists, analytical chemists, um, and uh, uh, also um, a lab... Uh, assistant and uh, administrator, um, but uh, yeah, a small team to cover a, a big issue. And we have a mission statement, as does uh, everyone these days. Uh, it's quite broad, but we spend a lot of our time providing scientific advice uh, and uh, information, uh, but also that research and analytical support. That's absolutely critical to Greenpeace to have that basis in science so that we've got the evidence, primary evidence that we're collecting. We also have to oversee all of the different scientific practice that happens elsewhere in Greenpeace. So whenever there's a report that's been produced or a press release, anything that makes reference to scientific issues, um, it's supposed to come across our desk so that we can check and engage with that. And then we also have the task to engage with the wider scientific community. That could be from the point of view of, uh, of debates, of uh, discussions, but also collaborative research, uh, either using our equipment or working with other labs to access uh, other equipment. And then to have a, a radar function, if you like, to look out there at the new risks um, that environmental organizations need to be addressing uh, of, uh, of a scientific nature. And then also to represent Greenpeace at the level of where science influences policy. Uh, so we're also representing Greenpeace at those international treaties and conventions, bringing the scientific data that we get to those forums so that we can uh, also get the message across and influence on that level. And overall, this is about bearing witness, something that's underpinned Greenpeace as an environmental organization right from its inception was the concept of bearing witness. And what we're doing is bearing witness through the application of quite complex environmental forensic techniques. This is the range of uh, techniques that we have available to us uh, in our labs. So GCMS has been the mainstay of the work that we've done over many, many years. Uh, especially for persistent organic pollutants. Uh, we were able to extend into LCMS uh, with a high resolution accurate mass uh, system just a couple of years ago, and that's expanded our, our work into uh, pesticides and uh, veterinary drugs, antimicrobials, those kinds of things. We've long run ICPMS for metals work, uh, which gives us the sensitivity and also the breadth of, uh, of operation that we need to do that forensic analysis. FTIR, which I'll be talking about, is a relatively new thing for us in the last uh, uh, year and a half, but uh, already we've been able to apply it quite uh, broadly. And then we maintain, as any uh, environmental lab, a range of field equipment um, that we either go and use ourselves or we make available to Greenpeace's offices around the world. Uh, we're also responsible for providing some of that radiation protection radiation safety advice, so we have experts within our group and also equipment that we can use for field monitoring for radiation and also advice on radiation. And of course, we can't do everything in our labs, so we rely on having good working relationships 
within the University of Exeter, but also with lots of other laboratories around the UK and elsewhere. Uh, we've got a very simple website. Don't expect anything complicated. I'm the, uh, the web developer, so I'm, and I'm not, uh, not good at that kind of thing. But at least if you want to get access to our papers and reports, they're available there through uh, scienceunit.greenpeace.org. Um, and if you want to follow us on Twitter, then we've also got a fairly low-grade Twitter account, but at least it'll give you some idea of uh, uh, what we think is important and what's going on out there. So I'm going to talk about the work we do on plastics. I don't have to introduce to you the fact that this is a global problem. It's a, a huge issue for the marine environment, but also terrestrial and fresh waters. Um, and uh, everyone, I think, has to mention Blue Planet. It seems to be a, a necessary thing, but uh, Blue Planet has been fantastic in terms of raising the profile uh, for the kind of research that a lot of groups are doing uh, in the background. And of course, it's not just the big pieces of plastic that are a problem. What we're focusing on primarily are the microplastics. So either the deliberately manufactured or the breakdown uh, or break up products, if you like. They say plastics don't break down, they break up. Uh, all of those break up products uh, that are distributed through the environment. In the past, we've been a little bit limited in what we've been able to do with the techniques that we had. We had a very small uh, FTIR system. Some of you may know the kind of thing I'm talking about, not mentioning any brands. Um, but uh, we were able then to look at things like microbeads in um, personal care products. Uh, this is a Petri dish, standard size Petri dish, and it contains all of the non-soluble material from a typical tube of facial scrub. Again, mentioning no brand names. Uh, and that was about, uh, I suppose, uh, half a centimeter or more deep in the Petri dish. And we thought that the blue pieces here were probably plastic microbeads. And in fact, um, well, that's a, a micrograph. You can see that they're very uniform and clearly they're, they're manufactured microbeads. They're polyethylene. Uh, we were able to see that with our, our small FTIR system. What we didn't realize initially is that all of the smaller, more irregular white pieces are also polyethylene. So a huge amount of, uh, of microbeads in that one tube of product. Um, thankfully now, of course, we've got regulations coming in in the UK and elsewhere that should make microbeads in products a bit of a thing of the past. But uh, nonetheless, it showed the power of the uh, FTIR system um, as a technique in order to be able to get at the depths of uh, that information. Since then, we have a new FTIR system. Um, we have a uh, research uh, partnership with Perkin Elmer, which meant that we've been able to, uh, to buy this piece of equipment um, and have a uh, relationship with Perkin Elmer in terms of keeping it running. Um, we're free to do our own research on it. We, we set our own research agenda, um, but uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, it's a very uh, um, hugely valuable piece of equipment um, with uh, ATR, of course, for large pieces of plastic down to a, a millimeter or so, and the, uh, the microscope system for everything below that down to around about uh, 15, 10, 15, 20 microns. Uh, we also rely quite a lot on uh, this little accessory. Um, it's a micro ATR, uh, which means that we can contact uh, even small pieces of plastic where we're not getting a good uh, uh, infrared spectrum using the, uh, the standard uh, microscope objective or with the, uh, the scanning uh, imaging system. Uh, that's been uh, very useful. And we also have a, an imaging ATR system that we've used uh, where we're dealing with uh, quite complex mixtures of microplastics um, that are concentrated in a small area. Uh, and that's been very useful for teasing out the, uh, the mixture of, uh, of plastics that are present there. So that's the system that we've been using. I want to talk to you about some of the work that we've done with it. You may be familiar with, uh, with some of this already. Um, but last year over the summer, we did some work in Scotland. You'd be surprised. The UK waters are um, relatively well researched in terms of microplastics. But in Scotland, it's almost uh, a gap. So the UK well researched, but mainly around the coast of England and parts of Wales, very little in Scotland. So we thought that was a gap. We wanted to go and see whether even in some of these really remote areas, we could find a problem uh, with, uh, with plastics. And of course, um, everywhere you look on the beaches, you find a lot of plastics, a lot of fishing gear, a lot of bottles, 
a uh, lot of uh, washed up um, large pieces of, uh, of plastic and of course it makes great nesting material sadly uh, and uh, ends up in uh, in the bodies of the chicks um, but we were also concerned for these guys here basking sharks they're feeding a lot in that area it's a very important area for them to be feeding uh, and even if they're managing to avoid the large pieces of plastic we wanted to know whether we could find um, microplastics there that could be contributing overall to their exposure to plastic and their exposure to the chemicals that are associated with those microplastics. Uh, so we used our ship, the Beluga 2. Uh, we did uh, trawls with a, a manta net at the surface uh, at a number of locations around Scotland in the summer of uh, 2017. That's the net being deployed uh, out to the side of the ship. Uh, and obviously uh, to, uh, to windward of the ship so that we're not picking up any signal from the ship itself. Um, that's the net going in and that's how it looks in the water so that it collects the surface floating plastic. So we're sampling here probably the top 50 centimetres or so of water. Um, that's only a fraction of the problem with, with plastics. So you can see what's on the beaches. It's also down deeper in the water. It's also in the sediments. We're not looking at that. We're just looking at that surface layer. And once we've taken the net out, after towing it for about an hour in each case, um, which takes us a few miles, um, we're then able to physically pick through the sample, through the sieve, uh, collect up the individual pieces of what we think may be plastics, get them back to the lab, and then we can analyze them with the, uh, the FTIR system. In this case, we can use the ATR. It's relatively large pieces. We can pick them up with a pair of forceps. Uh, we can put them on the, uh, the system, and we can analyze. And we're finding, of course, quite common forms of, uh, of plastic. Um, these are the three that we found most commonly. Um, polyethylene, of course, lots of single-use plastics. Polypropylene, things that are used in bottle tops, uh, that kind of thing. And nylon, probably a mixture of uh, fibers from textiles, um, but also uh, fishing gear, that kind of thing, turning up um, in, those, uh, in those samples. And these are not to say, of course, that these are the only things that are there. Uh, we found quite a range of different plastics. These were the most abundant, partly because they are so widely used, partly because they have a lower density than some of the other plastics. So if we'd sampled at the sediment or into deep waters, we probably would have found quite a different mix of the, uh, the plastics. So that's already interesting. Um, we're also looking at the chemicals that are carried in the structure of those plastics and also on their surfaces. Uh, and that can happen partly because plastics contain additives, colors, softeners, UV uh, 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 protectors, fire retardants in some cases, but they can also pick up chemicals from the water in which they're floating. They can act as mini sponges, if you like, um, picking up those chemicals from the water and concentrating some of them on their surfaces. So in that case, what we did with each of those mixed samples of microplastics from each location, we then subjected them to quite a detailed series of, uh, of analyses, um, extracting first with a relatively mild uh, solvent mix for LCMS, then a more um, heavy solvent mix for the GCMS work, and then finally uh, an acid digest in order to pull out the metals. All done on the same small um, samples. In some cases, uh, probably only a, about uh, one or 200 milligrams of plastic, um, but nonetheless able to pull out quite a range of uh, of different contaminants. And this just gives a, a sense of the complexity. I'm not expecting you to see the details here, but every single sample we looked at, as you may expect, gave us a completely different chromatogram, completely different mix of chemicals. And even if we were to put the net in on two consecutive hours at the same location, tow it over exactly the same um, area, we were getting very different answers. Sometimes we would do that and find no microplastics. The following hour, we may find 10 or 15 pieces of microplastic in that tow. So it's a very variable thing to try and, and, and describe. And the chemical contamination, similar. Sometimes we found very few chemicals. In other cases, we may be found only two or three pieces of microplastic, but we were finding a huge different range of chemical groups. And amongst those that we're finding, the phthalate esters, you may be uh, not surprised to find. They're softeners that are present uh, everywhere in, uh, in a lot of plastics, but also in the environment. Uh, we also found residues of pesticides, um, organophosphates that could be coming through from sewage treatment works perhaps, or maybe part of the plastic themselves, the UV stabilizers, 
um, things from personal care products uh, and also a range of different metals at varying concentrations. Um, so these things are not just a burden of microplastics, they're also quite a complex delivery system for chemical contamination. Now we don't know how significant that is for the basking sharks. But when you think that in some cases we were able to find 10 or 15 pieces of microplastic by towing the net for an hour, the volume that we were sweeping was about one third of what a basking shark would take in in the same period. And when you think a basking shark is feeding for hours in every day, you can see that that could multiply up uh, and become a problem that's clearly there, but we don't know the, uh, the full magnitude of. What we also did then was to take the residue of those samples, the bits that we couldn't see, the bits we couldn't find in the sieve, uh, and filter them uh, using a silver filter so that we were getting a really good um, background for the uh, infrared. And we were able to find a whole range of uh, hidden microplastics uh, that we otherwise weren't going to see, including uh, more nylon, polyester, polyacrylamide, um, and uh, lots of other forms of, uh, of plastic. The chemical analysis of that we weren't able to do. These are such small pieces of, uh, of plastic, it's not possible. But are they having an impact on the marine ecosystem? These are in the size range that a lot of marine plankton are feeding. So undoubtedly they're taking in these plastics. Is that having an impact on their populations? We don't know at this stage, but clearly it's a concern. Um, we've applied similar techniques more recently in the Arctic. So this was a, a cruise that was done in the early part of this year um, around the Antarctic Peninsula. Again, using a mantinet, but also just taking surface water samples. Uh, and in this case, looking at uh, just the, uh, the five micron fil uh, filtered uh, uh, samples. And again, finding a range of, uh, of plastics, polyester, polypropylene, perhaps breaking off from, um, from fishing ropes or twine used on, on board ships. Um, also, uh, uh, Teflon, PTFE. Uh, and in fact, in several cases, we were finding little pieces of woven Teflon, possibly coming from jackets or something that people are wearing down in, uh, in cold conditions down in the, Arctic, in the Antarctic. We also find a lot of cellulose. I'll come back to that at the end. It's something that's a feature of a lot of publications where people are looking at microfibers in marine systems. Yes, you find the plastics. You also find a lot of cellulose, modified cellulose fibers. And it's uh, uh, an interesting um, problem that uh, people are coming up against. So these reports are all available um, uh, online. I can, uh, you can find them on the, uh, the website that I've, I've pointed you to. And you can see in this case, with the Antarctic samples, actually the majority of the fibers we were finding were cellulose. Um, could be cotton, perhaps. Could be uh, cellulose acetate fibers. Could be misidentified. But this is something that's being reported again and again in the technical literature. And I think it's something that we've got to get a better handle on. Other things we've used our system for, um, much more kind of engagement with science. This was a project we did with school children across the Mediterranean. They were collecting beach sand, sieving it, and then we were able to analyze those samples and send them back a kind of colored picture of what types of plastic they were finding in their beach sand. Very simple with, a, with an ATR system uh, and a very powerful message for the children to be involved in uh, doing that kind of work. We've also been able to check the uh, veracity of claims for biodegradable bags. So these are some bags that were being um, promoted in uh, South America, um, bags and food containers as being biodegradable or compostable. And we were able to check them and find in fact that they were conventional plastics. Maybe they'd been manufactured from uh, biomaterials, but they were definitely not uh, any special um, plastic. And an interesting one from the UK, um, Sanitary products, tampons. Uh, we've got one here which is a conventional one, one which is sold as an organic product. And it gets organic certification because it uses a bio source of carbon. And yet it's polyethylene wrapped in polypropylene. So this is something we're now challenging through the organic system, uh, the certification system to say, why is it that they're getting organic certification when in fact it's just the source that they're getting um, certification for and not the final material. Um, we're doing a lot of collaborative research. Some of this is about to be published, so I would say watch this space. Um, some research on microplastics in um, whales and dolphins around the coast of the UK, the first time that's been done, looking in their guts. A paper on uh, turtles, um, contamination in turtles in the Atlantic and the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, which has just been accepted for publication uh, in conservation biology. 
Um, we've done some work with uh, researchers in China looking at degradation of microbeads in personal care products. Um, these beautiful things here are polystyrene microbeads, and it's what gives the glitter in uh, the glittery uh, um, foundation and uh, lip gloss and that kind of thing. Uh, when you look at it under a microscope, it's lots and lots of polystyrene microbeads. And some research that we've just finished at the moment is looking at how krill um, in Antarctica are actually taking in pieces of microplastic, breaking them down into even smaller bits, and then releasing them again. So that's complicating the picture even more, and we don't know to what extent that's having an impact again on their biology. Um, we're just beginning to get to the basics of our system of understanding just what we can do with the imaging with our uh, Perkin Elmer system. Um, this is a trial that we've done relatively recently with samples that are collected onto a nylon mesh. And you can see already, for those of you who know, know about FTIR, if you've got something on a polymer background, it makes it really difficult to see the polymers. But unfortunately, marine scientists love nylon meshes to collect things because stuff goes through it quickly. So we're trying to work out methods by which we can actually tease out some of those uh, results, uh, despite the fact that they're sampled onto, uh, onto nylon meshes. And then three other pieces of work, just very quickly, that were coming up, um, that again we're using the system for. We've just got the samples back from the Baltic Sea, where we're looking at sea surface microplastics again. We'll apply the same techniques and the same chemistry to those. We're also looking for the first time at microplastics uh, in rivers in the Czech Republic. Um, nobody's looked before and we're looking upstream and downstream from sewage treatment works. And apparently, as I've been here today, some samples have turned up for me from Hawaii, from the uh, North Pacific Gyre, um, where we've got samples for uh, identification of the, uh, the plastic types. And that's a Greenpeace ship, which is then going to sail further south uh, and end up at Henderson Island, so one of the most remote places on the planet, and yet a place with some of the most polluted beaches on the planet with microplastics. I'll finish there. I'll just flag up some of the difficulties that we've had that I think are common to everyone using FTIR. That is, the sample itself. Getting a representative sample is so difficult. As I've said, you can put the net in twice at the sea surface. You can get totally different answers. So which one is representative? Both of them? I guess so. Um, the replication is, is very tricky. Once you've got your sample, when you're not dealing with a, a nice polymer mix, but you're dealing with a mix of polymers and a lot of biological material, You've then got to find ways of cleaning that up so you're not just getting a signal from all the stuff that's growing on it. Um, and even when you do that, you often end up with degraded plastics that have got a rough surface. They're not a flat surface. It makes uh, uh, infrared uh, rather tricky. Um, and then, of course, there's the polymer degradation, the presence of other pigments and additives in there, um, and the big issue of dealing with sample con contamination during collection. That's something that I think marine scientists need to get much smarter at, because when you look at some of the techniques that are used, where people are reporting finding microplastics in the environment, there's a lot of ways in which those microplastics could have crept in during the sample collection and preparation. And why are we finding cellulose everywhere? Who knows? So, I'll finish there. Any questions? Very, very happy to answer them. Okay, maybe we could uh, catch up afterwards if there's, if there's too many, but... Yeah, less than five uh, millimeters in, uh, in, in all dimensions. Um, although, in some cases, fibers will be longer than five millimeters, of course, but they'll be uh, much smaller uh, in terms of the diameter. Uh, that's now, I think, fairly generally accepted. Um, when you start getting really small, people then have another classification, which is nanoplastics, uh, and those are, are going to be really difficult to, qu to quantify and to characterize, uh, but they could be a big part of the toxicology problem. Drinking water, yes. Um, it's found in tap water, it's found in bottled water, it's even found in bottled beer. Um, some of that is probably coming through the processing and the bottling, especially when you're bottling in plastic bottles, but some of it is coming from the environment. We've also just uh, been helping a project that's been published recently 
on microplastics in sea salt, looking at sea salts from around the world. Uh, and you always find microplastics. In some cases, you find huge quantities of microplastics uh, in those salt samples. Again, partly from the environment, partly from the processing. So they're everywhere, unfortunately. And I've, I think probably some of you would have seen the reports just last week about microplastics being found in the human gut. Is that important in terms of toxicology? We don't know. Should they be there? Mm, probably not. Okay, I'll be around for another half an hour or so, so if anyone else has got any other questions, happy to take them offline. But thanks very much for your attention.